my name is uh, Matt Halliday. I am a business development manager in the Office of Technology Commercialization, and I'd like to welcome you here this morning for the Tech Showcase. Uh, we have a, a nice set of uh, presenters this morning from PIs and startup companies as well. Um, kind of the rules for the morning uh, for this section, we'll hold all questions till the end. There is some time afterwards for some networking, uh, so we'll just keep the presentations rolling. So please hold your questions till the uh, end after the drone show. There'll be approximately seven presentations and then we'll actually go outside for a, a, a drone demonstration. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that once we get there. Uh, but I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Jeff Siskind. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah, there's, there will be no audio in the room. It's live streaming through the camera. OK. So imagine you're driving in a car, trying to find a new building like the Conversion Center. And it's so new that your GPS doesn't know about it. And you can't find the building. How do you find it? Well, you ask a pedestrian for driving directions. And they tell you, and you follow the driving directions. Now imagine you're a self-driving car. How are you going to do that? Similarly, imagine you're a robot in a new building on campus, and you have to find the washroom, or you have to find the printer. You ask people and follow directions. That's what my research is about. This is joint research with uh, a collection of graduate students, and I'm going to show you three systems today that know how to engage a human in natural language dialogue, ultimately speech, and then have a robot, a physical robot, follow the directions to get to its destination. The first system I'm going to show you, we built about uh, six or seven years ago, um, and the crucial thing about this is that it understands complex directions and understands every single word in the directions. So I'm going to change just a single word, and the robot's going to follow a completely different path. It's going to go to the box that's behind the cone and to the right of the chair. And now, I'm going to change the word to in front of. And it's going to follow a completely different set of directions. The same robot in the same environment, changing one word. And it goes to a, along a different path to a different destination. And I'll change yet another word, left of. And it goes on yet another distinct path. So it has very deep understanding of at least this subset of English, and know how to follow directions. Now I'm going to show you a far more sophisticated system. And you see here the internal representation of the driving directions that the robot obtained from a dialogue in speech with a human user. And now it's executing those navigation instructions in an environment that it's never seen before, and it's figuring out the environment as it goes along. Okay. So now in this case, the crucial thing is that the robot engaged in a multi-turn dialogue with the human. It had to find a room. It asked the user, how do I find the room? The user gave a partial description of the plan. The robot understood that it was an incomplete description of how to get to the room. It asked a follow-up question. The human gave an answer to that follow-up question. 
The robot then determined that it now had complete directions on how to find the room, and it executed those directions. But in this case, the robot was right in front of a human. What if the robot is someplace in a building it's never been before, and there's yo no human nearby, and you have to give it directions and has to follow directions? Well, it has to go find a person. And then, once it follows directions, it has to search the name tags on the room or the number tags on the room. And that's what this system is going to do, the second system. Posh, find room 1051. So we give the robot a goal. see in this window is it's going to try to find a person to approach and ask for directions. Just driving around looking for somebody. And it gets the end of the hallway, it turns around and continues looking elsewhere. You can follow the law of what's happening here. Now, it detects a person. It understands what it needs to be approachable, whether the person is moving towards the robot or walking away from the robot. Go straight and take a left. Again, an incomplete instruction. The room will be on the right. Thanks for your help. Have a great day. <laughs> now, you're going to see it's going to come in the hallway and it's going to discover that it can make a left. It's got a plan for what it's going to do, and it's executing step one of the plan. It says go forward until a left intersection, then turn left, and then the goal will be on your right, it's driving forward. And then it's now in step two, it's going to make a left turn. It's discovered that it can make a left turn. And now it's in step three, it's in the target hallway. Now it's going to look for doors. You see it's detected doors. And it's going to go to the door on the right because that's what we told it to do. And it's approaching the first door on the right to read the door tag. And then notice it's going to move its camera and it's going to scan for the door tag. It finds and reads the door tag. I have arrived at 1051. And it found its goal. Thank you. That's what I do. All right, next up is Professor John Song Zhang. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Jian Song Zhang, assistant professor at School of Construction Management Technology at Purdue University. So today we're going to uh, show uh, construction robotic systems for construction automation, uh, for construction automation. And uh, um, there have been some recent development for construction robots. Um, and what you are seeing here are two models from Japan, the one from the left-hand side 
is a, a tightly operated robot that can be used for railway construction. The one on the right hand side uh, is a humanoid robot uh, that was developed by AIST uh, agency uh, in Japan again. And it can be used to help with the timber uh, wood frame construction. As you can see, it is putting up a, a drywall panel there. So construction robots are here, right? Or are they? So by show of hands, how many of you have seen a construction robot? OK, we have three. And how many of you have seen construction robots in operation in person? Awesome, we do have one, OK. So uh, obviously, construction robots are not widely used um, still in the industry, right? Uh, why is that? Some background information of our construction industry. It has been lagging behind other non-farming industry in terms of automation and the you know, productivity. Uh, and there has also been this workforce shortage, uh, which is pretty uh, common you know, phenomenon nowadays across industries, but it is especially serious in our construction industry. For example, 80% um, of the contractors are failing uh, you know, in funding uh, skilled uh, workforce for their trace crew, trace or crew. So uh, the overarching goal of our technology, we do not want to reinvent the wheel or uh, you know, recreate construction robots from scratch. We want to build on existing solutions, but we want to enable them to be widely used on the job site and offsite as well. I will show you later. So the initial focus, uh, we are uh, focusing on the framing operations. There are two key technologies that I'm going to show today. The first one is uh, building information modeling based constructability evaluation through logic-based AI reasoning. So this will be useful to help us evaluate if existing robotic system can be used to achieve certain construction operations. And uh, secondly, we also work on uh, redesigning and extending the capabilities of existing robotic systems to adapt them, customize, and optimize them for the construction operations. Okay, so what is the beam-based constructability evaluation? Um, so the figure on the left-hand side shows the overall processes of this pretty much software system. You can think of it like that. It takes two types of inputs. The first input is a, a beam design. So this is the building design, and uh, you know nowadays uh, you know you, we are using building information modeling instead of um, let's say um, 2D plans, right? And uh, we are feeding the system with the international standard for the BIM data, which is the uh, ISO standard industry foundation classes, because it is neutral, transparent, and much more uh, robust to work with. And on the other hand, we also fit it with a robotic system that you are interested in using on your job site, okay? So once the system will feed these two types of inputs, it will run through physics-based simulations as well as logic-based AI reasoning to figure out, are these robotic systems able to support your workflow to achieve the uh, design that you want to construct? So the figure on the far right there, uh, this is an example. Let's say if you are interested to see, okay, uh, I want to uh, assemble some uh, timber frame walls, and I'm interested to see if certain existing, you know, industry robotic arms can do this job, okay? So you can feed this robotic arm and your, uh, you know, timber wall frame design into the system, and the simulation will run, and based on the logic, uh, logic reasoning and AI reasoning, it will tell you, okay, uh, during the operations, are there going to be any problems, right? So as you can see in the right color highlighted places, these are certain limitations. If you are going to use this specific type of robot for constructing uh, this piece of um, you know, timber frame, for example. All right, so that was the software side. Uh, what if the existing robotic system cannot be directly used for the construction operation that you are looking forward to? Then we can come in and customize, redesign, and extend the capability of the existing robotic system to make them work, okay? And that is the idea. So, oops, let's get too far. All right, so 
here uh, we are showing you another example of a hardware piece that has been redesigned. Actually, this is a, a patent pending device that we have designed specifically for the uh, framing operations. Uh, there are a lot of benefits of using this type of, I'm not sure if we can, right, so it can show the video. Uh, so we combine multiple operations into one, so you do not have to replace the end effector during the operation. You can place the material, fasten it, um, and it's also not limited to, uh, let's say, specific type of software, right? We have a IFC-based platform that can get the operation of this robotic device. Uh, it's lightweight, and we customize it. Uh, we can customize it to be compatible with a variety of existing robotic arms, um, you know, whichever model you want to use. And it, it was optimized for the framing tasks. We can use it both for the on-site construction and off-site construction, for example, in prefabrication scenario, okay? Um, so we have tested this uh, in a small prototype, um, you know, the hardware piece together with computer vision algorithms uh, to guide its operation. Uh, you know, in, at a small scale, you can see some of the um, small scale uh, wood pieces that we have used for the small test. And uh, we also have uh, tested the simulation, right, together and, you know, in parallel with these actual operations. So uh, the results were very good. So what we are looking forward to do next, uh, we want to test it in real scale. Uh, so we are looking to the use of, um, you know, industrial arms, that is, um, you know, heavy um, industrial arms. And uh, we want to test it in our construction lab. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, there's a two-ton crane uh, on the center, as you can see, and our students are building the uh, two-story steel structure and uh, a timber wood structure um, every semester there. Okay, that's all. So if you're interested in this technology, please contact Mr. Halliday. Uh, and we, we, our team are also participating in uh, National Science Foundation I-Corps uh, this fall semester. So um, I see Candy here. Candy is one of our uh, entrepreneurial co lead right? So if you're interested in our technology, reach out to Mr. Halliday or Candy. Thank you so much. Up next is, next is Professor Muhammad Jahan Shahi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Muhammad Jahan Shahi, an associate professor in civil engineering. The problem that we are dealing with is, are, is the nuclear power plant reactors. The reactors are under the water. You have to periodically inspect them to make sure there's no tiny cracks to avoid any catastrophic events. Um, in fact, as you can see in this picture, because the reactor is under the water, the direct inspection is not possible. What they do these days, they use a robotic arm that collects the video under the water, and then technicians go through the video, lengthy videos, and come up with a report that tell, okay, where the cracks are, how bad they are. As you can imagine, this process is very time-consuming, subjective, tedious, and costly. Furthermore, you know, um, as I said, the most predominant damage or defect that they are looking for are tiny cracks. On metallic surfaces under the water, as you can see here, here are sample, samples that you can see. The cracks are very, very tiny. The, the contrast is very low. It's very hard even for human eye to distinguish between cracks and weld, for instance. In addition, you might have very complex backgrounds, like, for instance, you might have weld, you might have grind marks, you might have scratches, which even make it harder because if, if you compare it to other surfaces like concrete or pavement. So the solution we are proposing and we've been working on is using artificial intelligence. To this end, we have developed a software where you can open the inspection videos and the, uh, using uh, advanced deep learning techniques, what the software does, it goes through all the frames and come up with a probabilistic report like the examples that you can see here. And it tells you in very long video sequences that you have where the cracks are, what is the thickness at the, of the crack, what is the length of the crack, and it can even automatically provide a report. So you can, for the next round of inspection, you can generate the same report and do the comparison to see how bad is the condition 
uh, of the uh, nuclear power reactor that you have. Uh, I would like to just, without going into details, just conceptually explain how this technology makes it, uh, you know, how is it better from the other existing work in this area, because there have been a lot of work for crack detection and using computer vision. But the point is that researchers may need, um, focus on processing one single image. But because we have inspection videos, as you can see here, I have extracted some frames from the video, and I can show you the tiny crack. Actually, I tried to highlight it, but basically if I remove it, you can see it's very hard to see it. And then the thing is that if you run the AI algorithm or machine learning algorithm, you can come up with the bounding boxes. In this case, as you can see, some of the frames, the machine was able to detect the crack where you have the red bounding box. Basically, now you can see the enlarged view of it. The point is, though, um, in some frames you may detect the crack, in some frames you may not detect it, there might be some false positives. How you make decision, how you fuse this information to have better prediction. This is what uh, makes our system different. And basically, this is inspired by human brain, because when you do the inspection, you may look at the crack from different angles. You may see the crack from one angle. You may not see it. You can re realize that it is a scratch from one angle and make decision about that. With that in mind, I would like to show you some examples here. The blue lines are the ground truth that's showing that there is a crack in the, in, inside the box. The red one is the result of the software that automatically processes the video and tells you there is a crack there. The yellow boxes are the enlarged view. The scales are given. For instance, in this case, you can see the crack has been detected uh, at the um, weld crown. Now, if you compare the performance of this technology with the uh, state-of-the-art texture analysis algorithm for crack detection, if you want to have 0.1 false positive per frame, um, texture analysis will give you about 62% hit rate, whereas this technology gives you about 98.6, which is about 32% improvement. So if you compare this with the manual uh, approach, it's going to be faster, more accurate, and inexpensive. Now, uh, when we were developing this technology, we were uh, approached by several high-profile uh, companies in uh, uh, basically nuclear industry. And they have signed non-disclosure agreements with us. In particular, Westinghouse currently is evaluating this software in Europe. And um, basically, as you can see, uh, the nuclear power plant industry is growing. There's going to be more need for this. And interestingly, at some point, a company called GEA, it's a multinational food industry headquartered in Germany, contacted us and said, you know, we have silos, metallic surfaces of three to four diameter, very tall. We cannot afford to have tiny cracks because the growth of the bacteria will ruin the product, for instance, if it is milk. So what they do, they fly a UAV inside the silo, collect huge amount of data, but the challenge for them is to go through these lengthy videos and identify where the cracks are and look at them. So they are also uh, using this technology and basically evaluating it with Westinghouse, they have shown keen interest to potentially license this technology after the period of uh, evaluation. But as you know, cracks are everywhere. In, uh, pre pretty much they are the first uh, indication of any type of failure. So we have been discussing this with many other companies in construction, road, uh, wind turbines, pipelines, and again, the big picture is the infrastructure that we have, even though the grade is C minus, you can see for many of the infrastructure we have D or D plus. As I said, the cracks are everywhere, so this can be extended to other uh, market sectors. So from market size, the total inspection market is about $12 billion. If we focus on nuclear power plants, it's going to be $3.6 billion. And if we go first after the um, the crack inspection of nuclear power plant reactors is going to be 15 million. So our plan is that to enhance the uh, system that we have based on the feedback from Westinghouse and GEA, and hopefully in about a year, licensing it to those two companies, and then move on to the other sectors like pipelines, gas and uh, um, oil, oil and gas industry, construction, and so forth. Uh, we have one uh, published U.S. patent, five, five uh, U.S. and international 
uh, patent applications and one uh, pending uh, copyright. Um, the team consists of myself, two PhD students. Uh, we have two former students that they did a lot on this technology. They are right now, at, one of them is, Am is at Amazon, the other one is at um, Microsoft. Um, thank you for your attention. Up next is Professor Shamali Chatterjee. Okay, so I will be telling you about our project on the semi-autonomous deployment of uh, drone swarms. So if you see drones swarming around campus, that's us. Okay, so this is about drone-based surveillance. Uh, unmanned aerial vehicles are promising surveillance instruments, and they have onboard cameras and sensors. And what we want to do is we want to monitor events on the ground that are not periodic or predictable and with high precision, so with minimum false positives. And we need to design algorithms for these drone swarms that can jointly optimize the detection rate for the events and the flying time. So the typical flying time of these DJI drones is pretty low, it's about 30 minutes. So we do this optimization, keeping an eye to the energy consumption by the drones, then we can basically increase the flying time as well while improving the detection rate. So there you see our uh, drone swarm, so that is schematic for our drone swarm. Our contribution is that every drone in the swarm, it is controlled by a control program, and that's where our algorithm lies, and this is uh, patent pending. It eliminates the costly process of training uh, drone pilots. There are two primitives that we use in our algorithm. Our algorithm is Argus, which is this uh, semi-automatic controller. And our components are the drone zoom component that monitors the ascent and descent, which is automated by our algorithm, and the drone cycle that determines the circular orbit. Now, the way we do this, look at the pipeline at the bottom. We have data collection and inference. So we have uh, drones that are flying at different heights. These images of the events, they are captured at these different heights. And then we have a deep neural network that is screening on these UAV images. And then we generate precision recall trends over these different heights. Now coming to this, we have this covariance matrix for even detection from different heights. And based on that, our Argus controller, remember I told you Argus has two components, the drone zoom and the drone cycle. So our Argus con controller comes up with the optimal deployment configuration of the different drones in the swarm to get the maximum detection rate in an energy aware manner. And then finally, that is our system set up. So you have the drone, the drone is interacting with the ground control system, which is essentially uh, the controller, and the controller is then interacting with our mobile GPU. So there is Wi-Fi connection there, and this is a tethered uh, wired connection. And this controller is doing both. It has the Argus controller, which is dispatching the commands to the ground control system that uses DYI to control the drones, and it's also doing the live mobile video object detection. Okay, so our technical contributions. What we try to do is we try to increase the coverage of the drones, right? We want to increase the coverage using the user-defined number of drones that are provided. So the number of drones in the swarm is what is provided by the user. And the user also comes up with, you know, what are the different requirements in terms of lag time, the delay time. So a point that has been visited by multiple drones, what is the interval between two visits on that point? So the swarm utility is a metric that we come up with to control the effectiveness of the drone swarm. And our work achieves the maximum swarm utility. Now the swarm utility is a function of the flight of view, and this flight of view is the flight of view of the camera, which is on board on the drones. And what we want to do is in order to increase the swarm utility, which is the optimization function, which is what the optimization function is solving to increase, we also want to decrease the flight of view. Uh, for So we want to decrease the overlap of the flight of view. Right? So this is what some of the parameters that our algorithm is taking into account to optimize the swarm utility, in this case, maximize the swarm utility. So what we do is, this is our typical pipeline. Like I said, you have multiple drones, wireless pairing, it's called the Wi-Fi, which is connected to the ground control system. And now we have an RTMP server, real-time messaging protocol, and this is ingesting all the swarm, all the RTMP streams from all these drones. And then we have object detection, so our video object detection plant 
exposing these RTMP streams and performing live object detection. And you actually see this is on campus. This is using our protocol. We have an acre, we have multiple cars, and with very high uh, detection, we have uh, prediction probability uh, above 0.9 for the most part. We are able to do this on the fly using our protocol. So this is uh, one of the components, to, to show you one of the components, a primitive that is being instantiated by August, which is our controller. It's the drone zoom. So if you have multiple drones, it tells you how is the automated descent going to take place so that you basically have the precision above a user-defined precision. Remember, you don't always 100% precision. So if the user gives you this is the required precision, we make sure our optimization algorithm always has that uh, lower precision in mind when it's giving you the configuration of the drones to deploy. Takeaways, uh, so we're using a circular mobility model and we have the ability to control the delay time between visits at a particular point in the surveilled area. If you look here, SD is the static deployment versus dynamic deployment. So on the top, you see static versus dynamic. The dynamic deployment is 3x the surveilled area. And in this specific case, uh, we have a lag time of 15 seconds. We also did experiments with a lag time of 10 seconds. And we can basically control this delay parameter. This is a user-defined delay parameter. And well, we are the best, we are the state of the art. We improve 150% in the detection rate for practical applications. Consider any application that you want to think of, which are you know, hard to predict. Uh, for example, far detection, adversarial, um, internet of battlefield applications, etc. But if you have specific applications where the sparsity or the sporadicity of the events is even lower, then we can go up to over 200%. And we use off-the-shelf object detection uh, to get these high accuracies to run this optimal configurations of these individual drones uh, in this uh, drone's work. And having said that, we are using off-the-shelf, but we also have our own pattern pending, uh, thanks to Matt and Andrew at OTC. We also have light reconfig, which does adaptive object detection. So what we can do is based on the complexity of the venues that you see under a specific condition, and based on the resource contention. So remember, these mobile phones, they have multiple things happening at the same time, right? So at the time, you're looking at your phone, uh, you have Siri on your phone. So depending on how much resource contention there is on these mobile object detection platforms, we do that in a cost, content, and resource contention aware manner. So we have these ob adaptive video object detection protocols, which we also are running on our drones in the drones form. Uh, so with that, I actually have a demo to show you that this works. Um, Go again. Okay. This shows our drone zoom technique used in our surveillance system. The drone is deployed in a parking lot and is using its video feed and an audio protector to observe cars in the area. To reduce the false positive, as soon as the drone observes a car with a precision below a threshold, it descends to a lower altitude to verify if it is a true positive. If the drone observes the car from the lower altitude, it will output that the car is a valid detection. After completing the observation, it automatically descends back to its original position using the navigation. And that's our team. Thank you very much. So now we're going to shift to a, a couple of our Purdue startup companies. The first is Eisen. Fortunately, they're unav unavailable in person, so they have recorded a video for us that I'm going to play now. Hello, everyone. This is Jim Fu, CEO of Eisen. Eisen is a tech startup based on new technology. A one-line summary of Eisen's work is discover Currents. We non invasively measure electrical currents with very high accuracy and utilize the measured current to discover something useful. I said technology is two tools. The first one is an accurate and non invasive current sensor. It is a flex high sensor, so we don't need to call down electrical system install the sensor, which is an important feature that others do not provide. We support both DC and AC measurement and has a very wide band range from million to kilogram. The system is fully integrated from the sensor to the cloud. So after the installation, the user 
just needs to go into a website to check and monitor the status of their system. Because of its ultra high accuracy, where others see noise, we see patterns. And by analyzing the patterns and learning from the patterns, we can not just monitor the status of your system, but also and diagnose and predict potential failures. There are four important markets that I say is professional. Oil fitting, electrical vehicles, telecom, and smart building and factory. Indeed, how you fit this sector, I said products can monitor and diagnose the health conditions of grid devices such as lightning connectors, transformers, generator motors, and power transmission lines. In the EV sector, Aizen products can monitor and diagnose the different conditions of electrical engines, lead generated braking systems, and charging modules, and can be used for EV testing equipment. In the telecom sector, Aizen products can monitor and diagnose the health conditions of telecom modules, such as load B and under sea repeaters. We can also use it to optimize the power efficiency of cloud servers. In the smart building and factory sector, ISN's product can monitor and diagnose the health conditions of HVAC, chillers, elevators, and escalators. Among the four market segments, Kaizen has reached out to a few potential customers in the power utility sector first and has got very positive responses, particularly for the four specific products shown on this slide. A lighting restaurant is a device that discharges excessive charges to the ground when lightning strikes power stations to protect it. Because each strike damages the device gradually, the two companies regularly monitor and replace the damaged lighting resistors. The problem companies have is that they don't know when is the right time to replace them. I said product can predict the exact time for the replacement and as a result can save cost and prevent catastrophic failures. Power generator motors are very expensive and between companies monitor their status on a regular basis by stopping, disassembling, and inspecting each component, which costs a lot. And even so, they sometimes miss defects. Isaac's product can pinpoint the type of defects developed in a motor by analyzing the current data without stopping and disassembling it. Transformers age over time and event short pay. Between the companies need to replace them before it fails. However, finding the right time for the replacement is not trivial. That is why we regularly <coughs> see exploding transformers. Between the companies want to know when the right time to replace them, and I said startup can monitor and analyze the transformer leakage currents and predict the right time for the replacement and save cost. Power transmission fibers are damaged over time by thermal stresses and by animals such as mice and insects. Because most fibers are buried underground, visual damage inspection is not feasible in most cases. Isaac's product can tell the damages and potential failures by monitoring and analyzing the leakage current. IZEN is currently providing consulting services to a South Korean utility company designed on a uh, 10K contract for lighting restaurants and a 20K contract for generator motors. And motivated by the promising outcomes, the company plans to give a 100K POC contract to IZEN. And the POC term negotiation is in its final stage. 
because of the very harsh responses from a new tech company that resulted in a consulting and POC contracts, I then see the focus has been on smart grid. And we expect to generate initial recurring revenues in the smart grid sector first. Recently, Kyoko, a data analytics company, providing its services to many telecom companies and a few EV companies, saw the potential benefit of the strategic partnership with Aizen. And we are happy to announce that Kyoko and Aizen have agreed on a strategic partnership that will allow Aizen to utilize Kyoko's business development, marketing, and sales power and bring a total of 700k investment. Aizen will propel its business in the telecom and EV sectors through the partnership. So, if you have a system that uses electrical funds, and if you need an intelligent diagnosis of your system, we are here for you. Please contact us. And if you are interested in a strategic partnership, co-business development, or investment, please contact us. Thank you very much. And up next is the CEO of WaveLogics, Jennifer Rhodes. Good morning. So WaveLogics, at a high level, um, is interested in making infrastructure smart so that we can improve its integrity and its safety and also the performance and efficiency of those who build it. Um, specifically, what we've developed is, um, actually, maybe I'll go back so I, you can see the picture of the, um, of the device. Um, specifically, what we've developed is an IoT sensor that can collect a sample of freshly poured concrete and determine the strength in real time in place in the actual slab of interest. Um, and why is this important? Um, as many of you in the room probably know better than me, um, we need concrete to hit certain strengths in order for it to function as intended. So we don't want to be fixing potholes every six months in roadways. We certainly don't want catastrophic events, collapsed pedestrian bridges or other bridges or multi-story buildings, which can happen if concrete doesn't meet required strengths before we allow traffic on that structure or um, remove forms from one level and start building a second level before the first level is strong enough. So it's really important that we know the strength of the concrete. Um, the problem with this is that currently, um, the industry wants reliable, real-time, in-place concrete strength information. Um, but really, um, today, we don't have great solutions for that. Um, pretty much every current method for testing concrete strength involves um, preparing samples of concrete that we then destroy um, to test strength. So we're not getting in-place data. We're getting data based on much smaller structures um, that we then use to estimate the strength of the structure itself. And this is a cumbersome, time-consuming, often error-prone process. Um, with a lot of waste involved. So there are two current primary methods that are relied upon for testing concrete strength. One is destructive testing. Again, um, when we're pouring any structure, say it's a highway or a bridge, at the same time to the side of that, we will be pouring dozens upon dozens upon dozens of cylinders and beams. Um, these might be, um, you know, six by three inches, four by eight inches, much smaller than the structure we're building. Um, and because they're so much smaller, um, they will cure in a different way than the structure we're building. They don't generate the same level of heat. They don't tend to hit the same level of strengths. And so what happens often is we'll get a false negative. We might get a low break on a cylinder or a beam. And then the contractor may spend many, many hours trying to chase down why do we have this low break? Is there really something wrong with my structure or is it the cylinder that's been prepared. There are a number of quality control issues that arise with cylinder preparation, um, whether it's um, preparing it, um, curing it, transporting it, maintaining it, and then ultimately breaking it. There are lots of steps in the process that can go wrong, 
And so we very often do get um, a false negative or a low break. Um, so um, this is very labor intensive um, and very expensive. A lot of quality control labor involved with this, this process. And in addition, there's a significant amount of material waste. So imagine all of these um, samples of concrete being prepared, then they gotta go someplace. So either a landfill or if we're lucky, maybe they get recycled and used as a crushed up building material someplace else but it's a lot of waste. And in addition, because the industry knows that cylinder samples tend to break lower than structures, the industry as a whole over time has begun to over-design their structures. So we add more cement than is necessary to the structure so that we can be as sure as possible to hit the strengths that are required. Um, because you have to hit these strengths, not only for safety and the quality, but because this is how our contractors get paid. Um, they will submit to the payer on the project proof that they've hit the strength required by the specifications of the architect. And if they can't deliver that, they don't get a check. So as you can see, this is really important. The other piece that's important and why destructive testing is a challenge is because it's not in real time. We might break these at three days, seven days, 14 days, 28 days, but we as contractors wanna know much more quickly what is our strength? When can I open a road? I want to open in a few hours so as not to frustrate taxpayers. Um, but I don't want to open too soon because then we may destroy the, the structure and have to remake it, which also frustrates taxpayers. Um, so uh, this real time, um, not being able to have real time information with concrete breaking is a real challenge. The other current method primarily used is a maturity method. And this is similar to our product, which I'm getting ready to describe in more detail. Um, similar in that it's a sensor. So, um, and they're deployed very similar to our product. You place the sensor in the freshly poured concrete and you get information back. The problem with maturity is that it too relies on concrete breaks. So in order to predict concrete strength using the maturity method, you have to have an advance um, prepared samples using the concrete mix you intend to use in your project and then break those and build a calibration curve, a maturity curve. And then you use that to predict the strength of the concrete using the maturity sensor. The maturity sensor relies only on the temperature of the concrete and time that has passed from um, the moment it was poured. And through that we can predict the strength over time of the concrete. But again, um, although this gives us real-time data, which is great because what we want to do is accelerate construction schedules, the challenge is that um, we're still having to break concrete samples to get there. With our solution, our Rebel sensor, um, again, it's an IoT sensor. It's electrical impedance based. Um, we embed a sensor in the freshly poured concrete and we don't have to have a maturity curve. Um, this is not mixed design dependent. Um, with maturity, once I build a, a curve, if I change my mix design, which happens all the time in projects, if I change my mix design, I need to build a new curve. These, are, these take at least a week, usually, um, and there's several thousand dollars to um, have that developed. Here, there's no maturity curve required whatsoever. We're not mix design dependent. Um, we are a direct in-place measurement of concrete strength. We're not measuring a small sample. It's the actual slab. Um, we give real-time data. The user can be sitting at home on his couch at night looking at where is my strength today. They'll see an actual number in um, PSI showing them the strength they've hit as of that moment in time, and they can then say, okay, I need my guys at 6 a.m. on the I-70 bridge um, because we're ready for the next step. Um, or if it's not ready, they can send them someplace else. So you can imagine the efficiencies that are created for con uh, contractors and engineers. Um, also, um, there's a longer term monitoring capability with our product. So with, um, with breaks, you can only monitor for as long as you've got a cylinder to break at a particular day. Um, similarly with maturity, um, really that's only good for about three days because temperature, internal temperature of concrete stops changing after that point. So I can only tell you for about three days what my strength growth is with that, that method. With our method, as long as the sensor's embedded, which is gonna be forever, and it's plugged into our data logger, which you can see in this photo here, um, you can collect data as long as you want. This is a rechargeable data logger. 
So again, our solution um, relies on electrical impedance. So it's basically um, a cup, a, a reservoir that captures freshly poured concrete. And the center of that cup is a PZT, a piezoelectric sensor um, that um, provides frequency information um, relating to the concrete. So we, we capture the modulus, the elast elastic modulus value of the concrete itself. And then that is transferred through the cloud to our server where we have a proprietary algorithm that converts the modulus to PSI, which is what contractors want to know um, in the industry. So um, this information again is transferred back automatically to whatever device they're using, a computer, mobile phone, whatever, um, they'll get a, a, a value of PSI. Um, here, um, I've got a very short example of how this, this works. You really have to, it's like a small town with one stop sign. You gotta look really quick because it, it goes in about five seconds. If I can get it to play, Matt, am I? Oh, there it goes. Okay, so basically the, the reservoir I described, the sensor itself, you just lay it in the groundwork. I'll maybe play it a couple times since it's only five seconds, a few seconds. And you literally just let the concrete fall on top of it. You don't have to secure it. Um, if you're doing this with a bridge, we would use um, some zip ties or something to secure it to the rebar. But in groundwork, like a pavement project, as we were on here in Fort Wayne, it just literally dumps on top, captures the sample of the concrete, and then can take its measurement. Okay. Um, so progress to date. Um, this project started um, through a commissioning by the Indiana Department of Transportation. They reached out to Dr. Liu, um, who's in the audience today, um, and her lab to see if she could help them solve this problem of really wanting to get traffic opened sooner, um, but not destroy the structure they've just spent a whole lot of money to build. Um, so that was in 2017. Um, since that time, there's been a significant amount of lab testing in field testing, prototyping, reprototyping, reprototyping. Um, we've basically gone from, you know, kind of a microwave size impedance analyzer down to what was maybe the size of a garage door opener. And eventually we made it a little bigger because we didn't want these things to get lost on construction sites or destroyed too easily. Um, and now um, we have officially um, spun out of the Lyle School of Civil Engineering and um, licensed the technology from Purdue. Um, in 2021, just last year, we were named as an ASCE game changer. Um, they select a number of innovations every year um, and we were one, one selected, very proud of that. And now this year we've transferred our prototype to an actual small batch manufacturing run and those products coming off that manufacturing line will be used in a beta release. We've got um, seven DOT projects scheduled across the country um, that we're going to be conducting testing with customers. They're gonna be actually using the device themselves and giving us feedback so that we can make any refinements needed for a planned commercial release in 2023. This is our fantastic team. Um, again, Dr. Liu, um, um, and Joe Shutterly, who's one of our early investors and a, just an expert in concrete finishing. Um, you won't meet somebody probably that understands concrete better than this guy. So super lucky to have him on our team and some fantastic engineers who are students at Purdue. Ji Hao is a PhD student. Henry is um, still in his undergrad program in computer engineering. Andy Aldigis just recently, um, well, not so recently, but graduated from Purdue undergrad and then his master's from University of Pittsburgh. Um, we have a CFO on team who's amazing. Um, and we've really generated a lot of traction and support in a short amount of time through the great help of Purdue and the and NDOT and um, local um, concrete um, pro providers, producers, um, great companies like um, uh, R.L. McCoy and others who are willing to put us in their projects and give us um, a chance to develop and refine ourselves. So thank you for your time. And the last presentation is going to be from James Gopert. He's going to give a quick overview of a, the drone show, and then we'll proceed out there when he releases this for the actual demonstration. All right. I'm very happy to be here. I'm uh, Dr. James Gopert from 
Aero Astro, and I'm also here today uh, talking about PERT with uh, Professor Yong Sing Liu uh, from ECE. And uh, this is kind of a unique facility that was just built in the last couple of years. And uh, I want to talk to you today about how it can be leveraged for smart cities. And uh, we're actually going to see a live demonstration of the technology of kind of our ground truth that we use to do all these really cool things with drones outside. Um, and to start us off, the PERT mission statement, so Purdue UAS Research and Test Facility, is to provide a world-class indoor motion capture environment for unmanned aerial systems research that attracts the brightest minds in the field and fosters autonomy education. So why are we so cool? Uh, we're the world's largest indoor motion capture facility uh, with 20,000 square feet and 30-foot ceiling. Uh, we basically uh, retrofitted a 1960s aircraft hangar with a million dollars of motion capture cameras. And uh, these are mixed reality, enabling sensor emulation, enabling real-time control uh, and feedback, which is what you're going to see out here. Uh, the drones that are going to be flying are, are getting a message from the motion capture system that we set up in this building at about 10, uh, 10 frames per second. Um, and uh, we also use this for ground truth. So when we're doing all of our cool UAS development, we need to know what the right answer is. And this provides us with a way of determining when the vision algorithms, uh, we're trying to make drones more like humans. So when they're using their, their eyeballs and they drift off track, um, looking at the landmarks in the room, uh, we, we can compare algorithm A to algorithm B and say why, why one algorithm is better. So uh, as part of this, we're working on urban air mobility uh, with NASA and looking at wind disturbances when you're trying to do uh, transport of people in an urban area up in different spots. How can you do this reliably uh, with wind kind of blowing you off track, uh, mathematically computing bounds? And as, as you mathematically compute these bounds, we want to be able to apply that in the lab and verify that those bounds actually hold experimentally. Um, another research project we're doing is uh, cybersecurity for an urban area like drone mesh network. You can imagine in a disaster situation, uh, the internet goes down, which would be horrible for everybody. Uh, these uh, drones actually fly up, and this is actually in the UAE. Uh, we're working with this uh, organiza research organization, TAI, and uh, they go up and form an uh, alternate internet. Uh, this alternate internet, of course, could be hacked uh, by you know, uh, people that were nefarious, and uh, we're trying to secure that and look at how we can best do that. And uh, another cool application, our team uh, just made it to the final round of the National Institute of Standards UAS Triple Challenge. Uh, this challenge is specifically look at, looking at lost hiker search and rescue. Uh, so we've actually gone down um, kind of a couple miles south of here out into a forest uh, with the permission of uh, some very nice uh, people and uh, recorded students walking back and forth in the forest with a radiometric thermal camera that actually measures human body heat. And we want uh, to basically plug this into a neural net, and our neural net detects uh, the humans as they see them. Uh, but there's a huge occlusion problem here, and that's something that the team's dealing with right now before we go to Mississippi in June, uh, end of June. Um, and uh, basically being able to send this to a neural net to detect it's a human and not a tree, you have all these trees and branches in the way. So you have to basically look at it as a time lapse and kind of stitch all those images together. So uh, you guys can see this drone outside. It's set up, so you can go ahead and take a look. Uh, we also are doing a collapsed building search and rescue with the Air Force. Uh, we're working with the Society of Women in Engineering on the annual Team Tech competition. And uh, this year, if you guys remember the building collapse in Florida, uh, we're flying a drone into a window, uh, trying to map all uh, human body heat and pet body heat and a 3D map that firefighters can hold up and look at and say that there's a human here, there's probably a pet here, uh, and figure out how to go save them. So that would save a lot of human lives if uh, something like this happened in the future. Uh, that drone is not here today. Uh, but we do have this drone, uh, time-critical medication delivery. Uh, we're working with the, the School of Nursing uh, and Biomedical Engineering. And uh, this is kind of a cool application. If somebody has an opioid over overdose in an urban or rural area, an ambulance has to get to them in 15 minutes or uh, they're in trouble. So um, basically, Purdue, uh, you know, per vision statement, uh, we want to be hosting annual competitions. We want to be known as world-class facility, accessible, sustainable, and synergistic. And... I'm going to leave it to you guys to uh, get outside, uh, check out the Drone Swarm Light Show, and if you could please uh, avoid using Wi-Fi because that's a real-time signal with the drones. So if they fly at you and you have your cell phone on, I'm blaming you. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you. Yeah, please.